Good morning. This morning we're very pleased to welcome back again the Reverend Cheryl uh, for this week too. Uh, next week uh, we will have another visiting minister, uh, the Reverend Norman Hutton. And I do believe it's his first time Norman has been preaching here. So we're looking forward to hearing Norman. Uh, Reverend McBride, as you know, will still be away in all this. Uh, any, any problems or any, if you contact me, <coughs> I'll put you uh, in the direction of who is COVID, doing pastoral cover while my Reverend McBride's away. Thank you. Well, good morning. Wonderful to be with you again today. And uh, we have good news to celebrate and the privilege of joining with people in spirit across the world throughout the generations. Um, God is good and is faithful and doing good things. So let us worship God and we unite together to sing what a friend we have in Jesus. Speak to us, word of truth. Our bodies are here. Bring together our distracted hearts and minds. Settle our will on knowing you, on loving and being loved by you. Let your eyes gaze into the depths of our souls. See there the longings the wrong and the good. Cleanse us of everything that is mean and selfish and sordid. Fill us instead with your spirit of love and generosity, of gratitude and joyfulness, spirit of peace who inspires hope and freedom. Come to this community, give welcome to the stranger, abundant treasures to those who have very little, and make this place and our lives a beacon of light to set the oppressed free, to release people from captivity, to addiction, to every form of corruption, so that together 
your new humanity will walk with you, free from guilt and shame, into fullness of life. We ask you, as your first disciples asked you to teach them to pray, and so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before we talk to the children, I'd like to read Psalm 123. Um, I'll be referring to it with the children. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us, for we've had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of the scorn of those who are at ease, of the contempt of the proud. Now, it's great to see you. Sorry, I, I think we started a bit early today. Um, I'm glad you've arrived, those of you that managed to make it in there, because I want to introduce my friend. It was so much fun here last week that I thought, as you all should think, if, if there's something worthwhile to hear, you've got to bring a friend to share it, don't you? So, are you coming up? Oh, I've lost my microphone. There we go. Hold on. There we are. No, just to... See, he's a better preacher than I am. He gets through the service a lot quicker. Okay. Tristan always looks very intent. Let me, I can't really show you here because there's no platform to put him on and I don't dare to set him on the Bible. But if he could, oh, he's looking, he's looking. Are you looking at me? No, not looking at me. What he did in Scarva. Oh, done it again. This is hilarious. Right. What he did in Scarva was he um, kept his eyes on me and looked up and I was able to get his attention. What do you see? That Bible passage said, as a servant looks to the hand of his master. What do you see? What's there? What's that? Oh, you're not looking? You're not paying attention? Maybe he's a bit more like us than I thought. Yes, but pay attention. Oh, yes. There we go. And I thought, what does he expect from the hand of his master? What does Tristan expect from the hand of his master? Does he expect me to smack him? No. Does he expect me to punish him? Does he expect me to give him treats? Mm -hmm. See, the kids understand this. You've got to do it, haven't you? Yeah. And look, I'm even holding him up. And sometimes when we have big obstacles to get past in our big walks, I have to carry him over the obstacles because he's only little. Sometimes he's a bit of a mountain goat and he climbs very well himself. But if it's a big muddy puddle, I'll, climb over, I'll carry him over it. He doesn't like to swim. Sure you don't. And God, God's hands are kind hands. God likes to feed us, to carry us, to show us love and affection. God doesn't want to beat us. He might occasionally have to correct us if we're going to get into trouble or do something that would be naughty and hurtful to other people, mind he? So sometimes we have to do a little bit of correction, but never to be cruel. That's not the kind of hands of the master. So as the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their master, let us 
look to the hand of God to provide for us, to take us on exciting journeys, to lead us on the big walks that God wants to take us on. Tristan loves to go on walks. And I love to walk with God and to discover the world alongside God and to know that God can see where the dangers are and God can provide for all our needs on the journey. So, who has a pet dog? You have a pet dog, okay, great. So you at least will be able to carry on that memory and, oops, thank you Tristan, you sit there, and know the merciful hand of God that is with us every time you look into your dog's loving and attentive eyes. And for the people outside in the car, I was just looking very attentively at the congregation there. <laughs> so we're going to sing together. Now, I didn't choose this hymn. Um, Trish chose it before, we, before she went away. Um, but she could have, couldn't really have chosen better. It's, Father, lead me day by day, ever in thy perfect way. So will we ask God to lead us and to take us on journeys with him as if we were his wee pup? Could we do that? Let's sing together. about Jesus taking his disciples out to discover the world. Not quite like we take a dog for a walk, but there's a little bit of a parallel. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. Uh, he left that place and came to his hometown. Hands up, who knows where Jesus' hometown was? Somebody shout it out. Heaven, that's what one of the kids said in Scarborough as well. You did, right? <laughs> But before he went to heaven, and that's a good point, um, where, was his, where was his hometown on earth? Anybody know? No, it wasn't Jerusalem either. We know he was born in Bethlehem, and he lived in Nazareth. Joseph was a, a carpenter in Nazareth, and that's where he grew up, Nazareth. At one time when I was on a plane, I met a man who was from Nazareth. It's a real life place even today. So he came to Nazareth, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that's been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, 
the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent, make a change in their lives. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. It's a 2,000 year old story with a story for us today. If you walk into a newsagent or a supermarket past the, past the newsstand, take a quick glance at the magazines. It's easy to see. People love celebrities. Their faces are all over the front covers. Stories about them sell newspapers. And there's something exciting, other, about these strangers with familiar faces that can fool us into thinking that people from other places are more interesting and more important than our neighbours, especially if they drive exotic cars and wear flashy clothes and seem successful and have lots of money. But our gospel today shows us that the really important people can be those we are used to seeing around. We take their presence for granted. Have a good look at the people about the ones you're sitting beside. Don't assume that you know all you need to know about them. To the inhabitants of Nazareth, Jesus was ordinary. Can you imagine that? Jesus was ordinary. And so, when he preaches in the synagogue, instead of listening to what he says, they dismiss it. Sure, it's only Jesus, Mary's son. Can you hear a wee snide remark in that? Mary's son, they didn't say Joseph's son. Mary's son, we know your background. We know you were born out of wedlock. We don't have to listen to you. Where has he got these crackpot ideas from anyway? You can read the sort of thing that Jesus was preaching in Luke chapter four. Uh, ideas of preaching good news to the poor, freedom to the oppressed, sight to the blind, proclaiming the year of God's favor, and leaving out the bit about God's judgment and destruction. It's idealistic nonsense, they think. So friends, pay attention to the people around you. Don't dismiss them just because you've known them a long time, because you see them every day, because you think you know something negative about them that gives you the right to write them off. Instead of dismissing their so-called new ideas as crackpot, listen with your head and your heart. Not every crackpot idea is a good one. Think through what is being said and test to see if what is being said could possibly be true. Could it be that the miracles Jesus did were a sign that he had God-given authority to say the things he was saying about God? See, God loves to surprise us in the ordinary by infusing everyday people and events with eternal significance. Next time you're about to kill a fly, 
even a green fly. Just take three seconds to look at it and wonder at the existence of this miracle of engineering. It seems to know where it wants to go and what it wants to do, but it's absolutely tiny. How could it possibly have a separate identity, a sense of self, a sense of being hungry, wanting to go somewhere and do something? How can it fly? How is that possible? Take nothing for granted. That's just a green fly. Now think about the people around you and how mysterious they are and what God might have made them capable of, for good or for ill. By noticing what's around us, we might discover what God wants to give to the world. What God shows to you as you notice things might be the thing that leads you into your sense of calling, your sense of what it is that lights your fire and equips you to be the person that becomes that scientist, that leader in business, that teacher that inspires a whole generation to do the world differently. Notice what it is that you notice and let God speak to you and through you. Oh, and don't take Jesus for granted either, because all of you are church-going people, so you're, you're used to the name of Jesus, and you probably reckon, well, we know quite a lot about him. But just because we've attended church all our lives does not mean we know all there is to know about Jesus. The people of Nazareth had known Jesus literally all their lives. Every day they were seeing him in the street. But they'd missed something very important about him and they didn't listen to what he had to say. They saw new ideas as heresy, and they took offense. They couldn't see that this was the truth of God that Jesus was calling them back to, and that they were the ones who were living with a, a, a small view of God, a diminished view of God, and that Jesus wanted to give them the fullness of the relationship with God for which they were designed. So friends, all of us are called by God to be transformed, constantly re renewed. Our minds need constantly that childlike freshness that makes us open to keep learning and to see where we've been blind up to this point. Don't blame yourself for your past blindness. Be grateful for what you now see and ask for more vision. If we keep assuming that we already know all we need to know about God, we'll miss what God is doing in our society. Jesus was limited in what he could do in Nazareth because people didn't trust him or engage with him constructively to discover, to ask him questions, to learn from him. They just wrote him off and therefore they missed out. There were one or two miracles, healings, cures. He still blessed those who came. But it would be a shame if God had to take his good news out beyond the church and leave the church with very little. But I kind of think that maybe that's what's happening sometimes, that we in the church are so used to talking about God that we take him for granted and we think we have it sussed got nothing more to learn and therefore we're missing the vastness of the grace of God which he is revealing to his people in the world and he wants you his disciples to take his gospel out to the world and bless them since most of Jesus own people aren't listening to him he decides to spread out his preaching and he sends out the twelve he sends them in twos because we need people. We shouldn't go on our own. And he orders them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, not a second tunic. This is a gospel of enoughness that he's asking his disciples to embody, to preach the news 
of the kingdom of God has to be done in an embodied way. So they're doing it by their simplicity, by trusting God for what they need, and then encouraging the rest of the world to let go of all the stuff that's holding them back so that they too can receive this relationship with God. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that village. Maybe there's something here about learning to stay put, to be present in this moment, to trust that where you are is where you're meant to be for now, until God moves you on. So let's relinquish our worship of the false gods of novelty, always needing the next new technology, the next new car, the new kitchen, the new house, the new job, a new husband or wife. That won't make you a better person than you are already. It won't ultimately make you happier. Will you dare to believe that God has given you enough? Your daily bread given today. Friends, if we say we follow Jesus, we will dare to embrace this gospel of enoughness. It may be powerful enough to set the human race and the whole biosphere free from the destruction that seems to be coming within the next few decades. You're hearing in the news about Canada and the ultra high temperatures there. We're hearing it about Canada because we have lots of contact with them because they're a country in the global north. But countries in the global south have been experiencing the climate change for decades already. Whether it does or doesn't stop the climate catastrophe that's coming, the good news of enoughness will, by definition, equip us to go through whatever is coming with courage, with integrity, with compassion, with joy and freedom. It might feel too big. You can't stop climate change. I can't stop climate change. I'm too small. Challenging global systems and patterns of destruction, of evil abuses of people, it all seems huge, but it's nothing new. In the 18th century, Marianne McCracken, a Presbyterian from this part of the world, William Wilberforce in England, they were daring to follow Jesus, opposing the use of people as slaves even while other Christians were saying that the Bible takes slavery for granted, the Bible sanctions sla slavery, so it's okay. Don't mention that their livelihoods and their wealth was dependent upon the use of slavery to produce sugar on the plantations. Whole empires were relying on slavery for their power. What chance did Mary Ann McCracken or William Wilberforce ever have of abolishing slavery? Maybe none. But it is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. When I used to hear that phrase, I thought it was about a romantic love. Now I know better. It's about the love of God. It is better to have loved as Marianne McCracken, Wilbur, William Wilberforce, and so many others have loved the poor, the oppressed, people who were being enslaved and demeaned, loved them even if they lost the battle or never saw a victory. Better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all, because actually loving is the true victory. Jesus was crucified. He loved and apparently lost. And that's the Lord that we follow. And so working for the freedom of others was the right thing to do. Could they have done more? Probably. People are still abused and enslaved today. Could we do more? Definitely. God alone knows what could, would, or should have happened. 
they tried to preach and teach the kingdom, not only in their activism, their political activities, but also in their character, in the way they went about what they did. This kind of integrity, this is something the world doesn't seem to know much about if you listen to politics today. It doesn't seem to matter that a government minister would betray his wife. What really matters is that he had a, an affair with somebody else and broke social uh, distancing guidelines. Whatever happened to integrity? Whatever happened to being trustworthy? Integrity, faithfulness, the character of God being reflected in our lives. That is the kingdom of God. It is the yeast that Jesus talks about when he says the kingdom of God is like yeast in a dough. And the yeast needs to be kneaded into the dough. The world is being transformed little by little but inexorably by the persistent hard work of kneading, spreading the leaven through the dough so that there will be people living out the spirit of Christ in every place, at every level of society. Working is part of it, but also resting, letting the yeast work. We are not driven that we have to work seven days, 24 hours a day, terrified of what will happen if we don't try hard enough. We dare to believe that the kingdom of God is at work. And if we let the dough rest, and if we allow the kingdom to have its impact, the whole dough will rise, will be lifted, will be made lighter, more delicious. The embodied values of God's kingdom are going into every place and every part of life, as you do in every place that you go. Let me just finish with one story, which leads up to our final hymn. In Philadelphia in 1820, uh, 1854, the Reverend Dudley Ting took over as pastor of the Church of the Epiphany when his father retired. It's a funny way to call a minister, wasn't it? But unlike his father, who was described as more moderate. Dudley Ting was a committed abolitionist. Pause for a moment. A committed abolitionist was not moderate. How many of us would consider supporting slavery to be a moderate position nowadays? In those days, he was considered radical and extremist because he opposed slavery. Just two years into his role in that church, people were so angry at his preaching against slavery that he was forced to resign. With a few loyal followers, he then organized the Church of the Covenant in Philadelphia. And in 1858, he held a rally for fathers and sons, and 5,000 people attended. Well, 5,000 men, anyway. He concluded the event with this. I would rather this right arm be amputated at the trunk than that I should come short of my duty to you in delivering God's message. Two weeks later, visiting a farm, Ting reached out to pet a mule that was working in the farm. It was pulling a thrasher, something dangerous, I don't understand it. But his sleeve got caught in the thrasher and his arm was pulled into the machine and torn from its socket. And a few days later, it had to be amputated at the shoulder. Without antibiotics, deadly infection set in. Before he died, they asked him, what will we tell the people? He replied, tell them, let us all stand up for Jesus. His friend, also a preacher, Dr. George Duffield, was touched by these words and wrote the hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. 
It's not a call to war and violence, though it talks about ye, soldiers of the cross. It's a call to faithful, courageous dedication, more courageous than a soldier armed with human weapons. Dedication to the paths of Christ's peace, to the good news that in Christ we have enough, more than enough to share, to bring good news to the poor and to set the oppressed free. So let's pray. Loving God, thank you for your generosity in giving us this beautiful world with just the right quantities of oxygen and water, land and sea. We thank you that you have made us capable of enjoying it as well as living from it. We thank you that you give us more than all we need. You yourself are all we need. You've given yourself to us in Christ and by his spirit poured out. So give us courage then to believe in your grace, to live by your spirit, to exercise your radical love and forgiveness, transforming us and our relationships from meanness to generosity. We want to stand up and follow Jesus. Show us how. We pray for those who protest the racist legacy of slavery, who affirm that black lives matter, and who stand up by kneeling down. Thank you for their courage, and grant them the freedom and the peace that they call for, and the justice that only you can bring. Lord, in our selfish and acquisitive, greedy world, show us how to stand up for Jesus where we live, to proclaim the enoughness, the liberation from stuff of your kingdom. Give us courage to believe that we have enough to share generously, that the poorest deserve justice, safe homes, food for body and soul. Lord, give us courage to be soldiers of the cross, not by killing people who disagree with us, but by us embracing the self-sacrificial love of Jesus. We pray for people in Canada and in many parts of the world suffering from climate change by our abuse of the earth's resources. Living presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, convict us of our fear, convince us we have all we need in Christ, supply all our needs, not according to gross domestic product and our annual salary and our pensions, but according to your riches, relational riches poured out for us in the blood of Christ and by your spirit. Lord, train us to love the people around us who seem unexciting, the ones we see every day. Teach us to be faithful in loving our nearest neighbors so that we're equipped and trained and ready to follow Jesus by loving our enemies. We name before you those you call us to love today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. So friends, let us stand up for Jesus, not beating each other down, but living in the truth of his gospel. Let's sing together.
And so, brothers and sisters, may the grace, the generosity of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love, the abounding love of God the Father and the communion and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you in all you do and say and think and empower you to live and be the kingdom of God in this world for as long as we live in this world and for eternity. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.